Thank you, everyone. We'll begin in, in a while. Thank you for waiting. Thank you everyone for coming in. Um, we're still waiting for more participants to come in and we'll begin in a short while. Hi, we have our head of department from the communication department in the School of Arts, Prof. Bradley. Prof, are you here? I am. Hello. Hi, Hi Prof. Thanks for coming. We also have another lecturer from our department. Dr. Norizati. Hello, good afternoon. Hi. It's great to be here. Thanks for uh, having me. Just uh, had a little problem with my microphone just now, but uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Looking forward to, uh, to the event. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. It is so great to see all of you participating in this very exciting webinar. Next Gen PR in collaboration with Mr. Jean Francois Cahelt, the founder and CEO of the IO Foundation, a nonprofit organization advocating for data-centric digital rights. We are proudly presenting today's webinar entitled, You and Your Data, What Needs to Change? My name is Jodi, and I am a year two communication student from the School of Arts, Sunway University, and I'll be your host for today. Before we begin, a gentle reminder to everyone to mute your audio and turn off your camera to ensure smoother running of today's webinar. If you have any questions for our speaker, do send them in the chat box or tap on the raise hand icon for assistance. So over the years, the term digital rights has been slowly gaining more awareness from the public due to its significance. Therefore, today's event is going to be very useful for anyone who is looking to better understand their digital privacy and how they can manage it. With that said, allow me to invite Dr. Catherine to come forward and start off with the welcoming speech. Well, Dr. Catherine is an esteemed senior lecturer and a postgraduate program leader in the Department of Communication, School of Arts, Sunway University. She also happens to be an extremely supportive friend and mentor behind the Next Gen PR team. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Catherine. Thank you, Jyoti. Good day, everyone. Uh, I am a senior lecturer at the Department of Communication and I'm very happy to, to invite all of you to present for, to be here today for the talk. So today, I would like to thank you again for allocating your time to join us for the talk on you and your data, what needs to change by Mr. John. Without further ado, let me introduce to you our guest speaker today. 
John is the founder and CEO of the IO Foundation, as mentioned by Jyoti, which advocate for data-centric digital rights. The IO Foundation is an organization dedicated to promote, protect, and provide solutions for digital rights. Disturbed by the level of intrusion of technology in the lives of citizens, John has taken the leap in 2018 to start off the IO Foundation to establish a more solid and targeted direction in addressing digital rights from a technical standards perspective. Furthermore, John has written an article regarding data-centric digital rights. It was published in the IO Foundation last year in April. And this article was also published in MCMC My Conversion in their 19th issue in 2020. Not only that, John has also volunteered in Spain and Malaysia for things ranging from soup kitchens to STI screening, therefore explain why he has a variety of experience in this area. We hope that you are able to gain some knowledge and insights from this talk today. Many of us might not completely aware of what our digital rights are. We have used digital media and we have provided data in many platforms. So I hoped that this event could be handy to all the participants here who are students as well as academic staff from Sunway University. That is my brief uh, speech about introducing the speaker and I'll pass it back to the MC, Jyoti. Well, thank you, Dr. Catherine, for your introduction. So now, ladies and gentlemen, now please join me in welcoming Mr. John. Thank you, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. It's a pleasure um, being here. And I would like to thank you for the opportunity to do this presentation. I see that the, the room is quite packed. So I'm going to, um, word of advice, I tend to not do talks that are too boring. So sit down, take your bearings, and next crack on. That allow me to share my screen and go through this traditional, a little bit awkward moment where people need to do things on their laptops before they can talk. All right. So as I said, let's crack on. Um, today, um, um, talk is going to be, uh, as mentioned, on, on data. Uh, but first, I would like to um, introduce myself a little bit. Although this has already been done. So my name is Jean-Francois. I go by John. Makes everybody's life easier. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of the IO Foundation. Uh, and the IO Foundation is essentially an organization advocating for data-centric digital rights, which doesn't have too much of an easy definition. Um, uh, in, in for, for the particulars of this, uh, of this presentation, I will define it as the advocacy of attempting that governments do the necessary so that every time that they issue a policy that has to do with public consumption software, or public consumption technology, it doesn't only come with a piece of paper with pretty words as to what is it that we would like to achieve, but also a technical standard on the implementation so that you can verify that whichever product or service that is claiming to be compliant actually is, and in a matter that it's going to be standardized. Today, we're going to be, uh, as the title says, talk about you, your data, and what is it that needs to be changing. And um, um, we're going to be looking quite a number of, of elements, kind of a satellite around the, the topic itself. And I'm going to be trying to compose a small puzzle. And by the end of the, of, the, uh, of the talk, I hope that all of those pieces fit properly for you. Now, let's take one step back first. And let's examine um, an industry that we normally are a little bit more uh, aware of, a little bit more familiar with, because we use it on, on, a, on a daily basis, because it's been uh, for quite some time uh, um, in, in society, which is specifically in Malaysia, um, the car industry. Now, when we buy a car, we know that there's been a number of um, um, management and policy that have been applied to the fact that the car has been delivered. What I mean by that is the government decides that cars need to be safe. And then they issue a number of policies as to what is it that the car needs to be incorporating in order to be safe. And so they say uh, cars need to have seat belts and they need to have airbags and they need to have maybe a system that breaks at this particular uh, speed for uh, a minimum of this particular or maximum of this particular distance. And in case of an impact, it has to be a deformation of a certain blah, 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 blah. Now, it doesn't only say that, it also issues a technical standard, a document that car manufacturers need to adhere to in order to be able to um, 
put into the market new cars. And so there's a whole procedure where, as a manufacturer, I get the policy, I get the technical standard, I study what is it that is expected from me, I do my design, pretty cars with very nice services, nice features, et cetera, et cetera. But once I'm done with that, I'm going to have to send a prototype to an agency. In the case of, of, uh, uh, of Malaysia, it will be the ASEAN NCAP. And they will do all of these things that you know, such as crash test dummies and, and so forth. And all of that is measured. And if you comply with that, then you get a sticker chopped somewhere that basically tells you now you can start selling. So what is the assumption that we take as a citizen? The assumption is the car is given to me that is following the regulations of my own jurisdiction, that is safe by design. And that is reassured to me by an agency that has the ability to verify that it is actually happening. And my part of responsibility is driving my car responsibly on the road. That's it. That's how we understand it. And, and everyone is, is fine with that. And everyone understands that the complexity of building a car is way too much for anyone to understand, except for those who build it, the engineers and the people who are supposed to be doing the management of the whole procedure. Now, you can think about other um, daily um, situations, like such as your tap water. Your tap water, in order for you to have potable water through your tap, that's not an easy task. It requires a lot of management. It requires a lot of effort. And all of that complexity is hidden uh, from you by the fact that there's a government taking care of it, there's an agency taking care of it, and uh, any company that wants to get into the um, water distribution business oh, requires you. to be able to abide with, uh, uh, with those regulations. And you can test it. Okay? Think about it. You don't go out of your house with a test kit anytime you go to the mamak making sure that you know, your TOI slim is actually okay. You look at, the, at your testing kit. You don't do that. The assumption is the tap water, the ice that I'm consuming is safe. Now, what is it that happens when it comes to public technology? The current state of affairs, and this is not only specific to Malaysia, it's actually happening all over the world. The current state of affairs is that governments are issuing data protection laws, for instance, that tell you what are the rights of the citizen, what are the rights of the user. And they tell you you have the right to rectification, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the problem with that is those documents do not come with a technical standard of implementation. So the, the, the situation is that you obtain software, you obtain, for instance, a smartphone, and you know that it does a lot of stuff in the, back, in the background, but you're not quite sure what it does. And, 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 and there isn't a very good way to actually verify whether it does it or not, because the agencies that are in charge of this are not, do not have the tools to be able to do that. So the hardware, in the case of, of Malaysia, for instance, that, that works well because that's under MCMC. And the hardware is something that does issue technical standards for a number of reasons. For instance, you know, making sure that the, the battery doesn't explode on your face. There's, there's a technical standard to, to define how the battery is going to be composed, what kind of, of chemicals can be, can be in there, the temperature it can rise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also the spectrum, for instance. So if you think about how the, the radio um, frequency spectrum is in Malaysia divided, the antennas and the models that are going to be sold in Malaysia need to be compliant with that. And, and all of that is documented and all of that can be tracked. What you cannot track is what happens in terms of software. So what is wrong with this picture? If you, if you start looking at the comparison from the different industries that I was mentioning before and, and, the, and the one that refers to technology, the life cycle of a product or the infrastructure that has to do with technology is radically different from the one that you have for any other established industries. And for a number of reasons that we're gonna be um, um, looking into. And so what happens is there is no specific way of verification that the software that I'm using is compliant with the regulations of my own jurisdiction. In this case, Malaysia, but you can even think about Europe and GDPR helps with the conversation. It helps to start with uh, thinking about things it still doesn't solve the problem at so many levels. Now, all of this, you may ask yourself, or maybe not, um, why are we in this, in this situation? Or, 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 or what has been creating or um, amplifying this situation? Well, there's a number of historical reasons, but there's also a number of fallacies that have become to be very um, predominant. And the one, one of the, the um, um, one of the fallacies that really make me laugh a lot or to be concerned me in, in, uh, in many ways is that the assumption that all of you must be hackers, nothing short of a hacker. 
So you need to know what is your device about, what it does, how to use it, how to configure it, how to put the settings, how to protect it. You need to know how to install the malware. You need to know how to update the malware. You need to make sure about, you know, what is the latest updates when it comes to malware as well? Do you have any spyware? Um, are they trying to do some phishing scam on you? Um, you need to update your applications. You need to look at the settings that the applications are requesting in terms of permissions. Are they actually trying to ask, uh, ask access to your camera? Does really a thermometer need to have access to your camera? Well, not really. That kind of thing. But on top of that, you need to know what, what is data? What's the kind of data that is extracted from you? Where is it used? Who is it shared with? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the, the level of complexity equivalent from how today we need to use our information and our devices, to me, I see it as every time I get into a public building, I need to get a master's degree to understand whether that building is safe or not for me, for every single building, for every single town that I visit. That would be a ridiculous assumption at any given time. So the question is, why are we allowing this? The problem is that we are, what we are doing is we are shifting the burden of responsibility from the actual people who should be taking care of this, which is the experts, all the supply chain and all the manufacturers into the shoulders of the final user, the final citizen. And that's ab absolutely unconscionable. Uh, we are basically making people tired of looking into this and not interested on how to defend their, their positions anymore. And there comes this fantastic fallacy and nothing to hide. Oh I, oh, I don't care if they're spying on me. I don't care if they get data about me because you know, I have nothing to hide. Well, Edward Snowden put it, put it very, very well. I mean, better than I could possibly do myself. He said that um, arguing that you don't care about your right of privacy because you have nothing to hide is the same as saying that you, have, that you don't care about freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. And I guess you can see where is the fallacy in there. And by the way, if, if any of you really thinks that you have um, nothing to hide, please type on the chat last time you had sex and your uh, debit card PIN number. I'm pretty sure most of us will know exactly what to do with that information. There is a lot of things that you need to keep private for many reasons, typically by societal reasons. And you don't want that information to be falling in the wrong hands because I, I can assure you more than one is going to be happy to weaponize that and to you know, take a profit out of it. So what is the problem at its origin? So we are looking that there's, there's something there that is not properly um, taken care of. And the problem at its origin is it's quite obvious when you think about it, but it's not necessarily obvious uh, un unless it's, uh, it's pointed out to you. It's a problem with the nature of data. At the moment, we are sort of having this feeling kind of um, Lord of the Rings, Middle, uh, uh, Middle Earth type of thing where data is this magical dust that is just surrounding us and some wizards can take it and make, you know, put it into, into a black cauldron and generate some magic solution with it. And, and the reality couldn't be further than that. We are absolutely connected with our data. Now, in order to understand exactly how data is connected to us, I would like to go through first understanding the kind of data that is extracted from, uh, from people. And the first one would be what you would call body. And what I mean by body is, it, is basically any physical attribute, whether your height, the color of your eyes, uh, you know, your weight, whether you have a heart condition, anything that has to do with your physicality, all right? Then comes the element of mind. And what I mean by mind is basically your personality, everything that is in the black box of your head. Um, so what are my preferences in terms of ice cream? What is the kind of, um, uh, of hobbies that I prefer to do? What is my level of, uh, of knowledge when it comes to math? Anything. What are my political preferences? What are my sexual orientation? Um, those are type of information that you get to know uh, from others as you interact with it. So you, you, you might meet some new person, um, go for dinner. And as you interact with that person, you get to know each other. And you are basically unfolding part of that information that is in the black box of the other person's uh, head. The problem with the technology is that it gets exacerbated. And not only that, we also are participating willingly to it. If you think about it, every time you're you are writing a review on a restaurant that you went that you didn't like, most of the time you will write reviews because we don't like something, you're essentially transcribing the feeling that is happening in your head into text 
that can be analyzed and can be um, automatically um, uh, parsed and extract the information of. Um, I can tell you that there's right now um, um, companies that are working on being able to put a chip in your head so they can actually, they claim to be able to help you with a number of tasks. Uh, that's gonna be problematic and the extraction of, uh, uh, of information is gonna be uh, exponentially growing. Now think about, think about the element of the mind as the emotional triggers that I can learn from you, that I can press as buttons to obtain a reaction from you. And the most typical one that we are obtaining at the moment is for instance, to change your political ideals so that you, you, change, you, you modify the outcome of an election or uh, consumption habits. So I, I can try to present something to you that, that might be very, very attractive and uh, uh, I might trigger this consumption trigger on consumption reaction on point. The third one that we are looking into is activities. So where do you move? Who do you interact with? Um, what are the type of things that you do? Where do you work? Where do you do your hobbies? Where do you go shopping? Uh, where do you go around with your family? All of that information is being tracked one way or another. And there's plenty of very smart slash cunning ways to, to do so. Now, what that does, when you put together this body, mind, and activities um, type of data, you can't imagine that what's really cre creating there is a model of you. All right? Data is not separated from you. It's not that magic dust that I was mentioning before. It's an actual reflection of you. In certain circles, that's called a digital twin. And there's plenty of those digital twins all over the, all, all over the place. Facebook has one of you. Twitter has another one of you. And they may be more or less complete depending on the information they've been able to, to extract from you not only from their platforms, but also with collaborations with their parties. Now, you have to think about that importance because the question then comes in what kind of digital world do you want to exist? Where is that data being, being, uh, being put? If you think about the, um, the physical anal uh, analogy, nowadays, nowadays, cloning is illegal. Let's, let's assume for a moment that it, that, that it was legal and I could clone you, make five or six copies of you, chop your limbs and send some of them to China, another piece of them to India, another piece of them to the US and someone to Russia, et cetera. I don't think too many of you will be feeling too comfortable about it. And so the problem that we have right now is that because this emotional detachment between the, us and the data that represents it, generates our digital twins, we are still looking at that as some very far away problem. Like it doesn't really concern me, that's not my problem. It is the problem because it is you. And I'm gonna caution you about something that is gonna be um, happening in, in, uh, in not too long. So um, right now, if I commit a crime, the police, let's say I kill someone in a, in a, um, um, in a room, well, let, let's do something else. I mean, I, mean I, I go to a bank and I rob a bank. The police is going to go looking around the the the, um, uh, the, um, the scene of the crime, and they will look in such as things such as pictures, but also uh, uh, footprints and all kinds of possible evidence that it was me who committed the um, the crime. Now, if I transpose that into the into the digital world, what the what um, um, cyber forensics will, will be doing is look into what are the elements in the trace in the breadcrumbs that you leave digitally uh, in, in your actions that could point out back into my computer as being the perpetrator of the attack of uh, you know, an online heist on let's say CIMB. Now, the way data is being extracted from all of us comes to the point where that particular behavior online can soon be replicated. And so the question is going to be at some point, if someone actually gets a piece of software, it's going to start running that information they know about us and impersonating us with such degree of, uh, um, of precision, how is a judge going to be making the distinction between it was me and it was actually someone who pretended to be? That's gonna be a very difficult problem moving forward, not, not to mention that a lot of judges don't even have the, the proper um, uh, technical um, training in order to, to avoid all of, this, all of these issues. And right now what we have is essentially, um, tons and tons of countries, jurisdictions, citizens, who first, they don't have a data protection law to, to protect them, that to begin with from a legal perspective, from a policy perspective. And second, 
even though they do have, there is no enough mechanisms in order to be able to enforce and to verify the compliance with those regulations and therefore putting all the burden of responsibility into, into the shoulders of the, of the citizens and citizens that, that generate this burnout. I mean, how many of you have ever read, for instance, terms, of, uh, terms and conditions of Facebook or Twitter and know exactly the kind of information that is extracted from you? I would invite any of you to actually do the exercise to get in, in on touch with them. They normally have procedures to request what is it that they know uh, about you, what's the information they know about you. And you'll be surprised about the amount, crazy amount of data they have collected all, all over the years. And in, most importantly, um, what they have inferred from you, what they believe that they may have never extracted exactly, yet they believe you might be falling into this or that category. And it's, it's, it's frankly scary. So if we want to try to change all of this, who will be involved in this, in this whole conversation? Well, there's a number of, uh, 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 of stakeholders here and, and pretty much everyone is, is involved. So you get um, from supranational organizations to governments, uh, CSOs, the citizens themselves, et cetera. So what is it that, that governments need to do? So the first thing is they need to realize that they are losing agency over their, um, over their citizens. If you understand that uh, as a government, you're tasked to protect your citizens physically and doing this, the, the, the jump from the physicality into the data representation, the digital twin is not such a big leap. Then understanding that protecting their data is just as much important. In fact, we argue in, in the AO Foundation that the case could be made that data protection laws may not have been necessary to begin with uh, because we had constitutional laws in most countries in the world. Specifically those who have data protection laws or had quite strong uh, uh, constitutional laws. And so uh, in the same way that that, constitu that, that, that constitution protects the, the citizens, it should probably have also protected the data in inland and in foreign, uh, in foreign land too. Um, there are mechanisms. The, the interesting part is, is how we've been sort of reinventing the, the wheel uh, when there were already mechanisms that have been um, designed and implemented for so many decades. Not saying that they are always perfect. You can always try to improve those mechanisms. However, they exist already. And trying to, re to reinvent the wheel is not always the, the right choice. And I cooperate. Well, corporate, of course, has a huge uh, responsibility here. Uh, and, and what they're going to, 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 to be realizing in the coming years is that there's going to be an advantage for uh, attracting people, by attracting customers who care about all, the, all of these topics and making sure that they retain them. Now, on the other hand, from, a, from, the, um, from the actual corporate uh, bottom line perspective, which is making money, well, not having a clear guidance of implementation as to whether you are not compliant to, to a specific data protection law on a, uh, on a jurisdiction is problematic because essentially it exposes you to high fees and then you need to budget those. And it also curtail, it also cuts down competitivity with startups who may not have enough resources or capacity or even knowledge or training in order to be able to be compliant. So the, the, the best way that you can have um, that is to have a standard that everyone can follow. And in fact, those standards, even part of the implementation could actually be given to you as part of the compliance from the government. And that would allow the government to verify compliance and corporates to know that they can de-risk their operations by just being compliant. And there has to be a point where um, organizations are embracing much more of this kind of, uh, of request. And hopefully they will also look into um, how to implement uh, a concept that is called um, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which I will also mention later, uh, which would provide them with a, a bit more tools and possibly a bit more understanding about what is it that it would be to treat the customers and their, um, their employees in a, um, let's put it in a nicer way. Now, supranational organizations, well, they do play an, an extreme role because there's a reason why we started them is to be able to, to sort out the mess that one specific individual um, country may not be able to address and to help and promote the cooperation between different jurisdictions in order to achieve a specific goal. That, that's why we have you know, groups and groups and groups of management one or the other. And so in the case of, uh, uh, of supranational organizations, they should definitely push for 
uh, the UNGP on business and human rights. And hopefully for one of the um, several projects, one of them is the, the one that PIF is proposing on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Now, when it comes to, to technology, there's this very important element of interoperability. And that can only be achieved if you have an organization that is basically overseeing and making sure that everyone is compatible with uh, the way the information is being uh, um, uh, exchanged between different systems. Um, when it comes to, to governments, those supranational organizations have a lot to say in there. Now, civil society organizations definitely also need to change the way they uh, look into technology. Um, until now, there's been a lot of um, focus on the policy making of, uh, of technology, which is fair enough. Uh, there's, there is, however, everything that has to do with the technical implementation that seemed to be left behind, and, and we, we can't neglect that anymore. We have to understand that um, technologies are the people who are going to be helping us shape those things, and we need to let them understand what is it that they need to do, what is the role that they have to play, and we need to bridge the gap between technologies and civil society and policy making. At the moment, is very, very wide, and they kind of try to avoid um, yeah, each other. I, I would argue that, for instance, civil society tends to remain in the last step of a, uh, of a policy um, um, draft. So they would say, for instance, wait for the government to have um, a public consultations or to have issued a zero draft for a specific new policy in order to go in and give um, their opinion. The problem with that is that by the time that policy is already written to 80%, and they might be giving you five to ten percent of margin just you know to to not create any any friction with civil society. But the bulk of the of the policy is going to be very difficult to um, uh, to change. It would require huge mobilization and a number of resources that possibly small NGOs may not even have the capacity. Or in places where NGOs cannot be uh, uh, cannot speak freely, it might just be flat impossible. Instead of doing that, one best entry point is basically at the public tender level. So when, for instance, MCS, MCMC releases uh, public tenders on digital identity um, consultation, that is when civil society should be entered in with technologies, not just with the policy perspective of it, but with actual people who can back up their requests on how to do a technical standard for compliance and for verification. That has to go hand in hand. It cannot be just only policy making anymore. Now, <clears throat> to us, the most important um, stakeholder in this whole conversation is by far technologists. Uh, we identify them as the next generation of rights defenders. And, and, and I don't think anyone can actually counter argue this because they are basically the architects and the builders of all the technology that we're so much concerned about. If we don't start letting them understand what kind of, of responsibility they have into, into this whole uh, mess, this whole situation, we are not going to get out of it. And so we need to start changing not only the way that we see technology, but also the way that those who build technology see technology. And what I mean by that is that the educational pipeline right now does not provide them with the necessary tools to understand what is the role. And the current language is missing in order to be able to bridge the, the explanation between what I create as a software engineer and the impact that it has. And I'm, I'm really talking from a technical perspective. There are no taxonomies, there are no explanations, there are no, there's no language to be able to explain those things. And so to give you an example, two doctors can talk to each other, try to figure out what's gonna be the rest, the right uh, course of action you know, to treat a patient because they have the language to describe the type of treatment, the type of side effects, the type of chemicals they're gonna be using, uh, the type of hospitalization, what's gonna be all that pathway is easily explainable and exchangeable between the two individuals because they have the language to, to, uh, to discuss that. And that's technical language. I mean, when you're talking about the compounds of, of our, well, let's say, uh, cancer treatment, you're not just talking about, you know, how good is it to, to be alive? You're actually looking into what is the actual definition of that compound, what is going to be the effect on the, um, on the system of the, um, of the patient. And you can extend that to pretty much any single other uh, big engineering that you can think of. So architecture, two architects can talk to each other because they know exactly what it is to talk about torsion, the concrete mix, as, and so forth and so forth. Now, that doesn't exist so far when it comes to, to, to uh, technology. And very specifically, the, the segment of technologies that we concentrate on the Air Foundation, which is programmers, there isn't an actual taxonomy for programmers to talk about. 
And so that really also creates a secondary effect that is very interesting. And then we need to start thinking about how to change this. A doctor will swear a Hippocratic oath. And an architect will actually um, 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 adhere to a specific organization. I believe you call them colleges, but I'm not sure in English. In Spanish is Colegio de Abogados or Colegio de Arquitectos. It's kind of a professional technical body in which you need to, uh, to register yourself if you want to exercise your, um, um, your job as an architect in a specific jurisdiction, because they take care of you being, uh, you know, having the qualifications and so forth. And that also has a legal liability um, uh, included. So if a, if a building crumbles, there is a liability uh, associated with it. If a, if a patient uh, dies, uh, there's gonna be an investigation to see what happened there. And not only that, architects and doctors can swear, I'm gonna be making sure to protect somebody's life because they can describe those dangers that otherwise can happen. Now there's been attempts on trying to provide uh, uh, liability to, to software engineers and they, they have failed. And in fact, there was one in, in, in Malaysia was told recently, and they have failed for a number of reasons. One of them is because they can't figure out why. So not only they're not interested on, 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 the, on the liability itself, which can be costly and, and so forth, and it can have dire consequences, but also is how do you define the things that you're trying to prevent? If you cannot define them, you can't get behind that. You can't get motivated to try to be the defender of that. And so the language part is gonna be critical moving, uh, moving forward when it comes to, to technology and we need to work on that. And, and of course, academia is gonna be playing a huge amount of, uh, um, uh, of importance in, in, in there. You, you need to think about how such a long, long lasting effort in order to generate and create new generation of technologies that will not only understand the syllabus and the taxonomies and all the concepts they need to get behind, but also eventually get into uh, uh, managerial positions in, in, in corporate or any other place to be able to exercise that change too. It's not gonna be something that happens overnight, but we need to start as soon as possible because otherwise it's never gonna happen. And academia is gonna really have a huge um, influence in, in this. Now, of course, citizens, we can't, we can't just let things happen um, 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 without being aware of what's going on. So the expectation for me would be that the experts will take care of the problematic. However, citizens need to be demanding this to change. And so the, the, the first step here is, and I hope that this, this, this talk is gonna just give you at least a, a few food for thought to, to go back home and, and to reflect on this and to start considering about the critical element of what's going on with the data and what kind of data they have about you and what is your data being used I'm pretty sure that if you were, if you were told um, the type of management or that manipulation or even weaponization that uh, data can be, um, can be exposed to, you'll be totally horrified. Um, after doing the Q&A later, I will, I will drop a, um, a link of a video that was leaked uh, from um, um, a former department from Google called Google X, which was uh, kind of the, the next frontier type of, uh, of, re of research department in, in Google. And this was a, a video that was allegedly commissioned by the ex head of, uh, of Google X in order to think a little bit about the importance and impact of mass data uh, um, uh, consolidation and, and, and the use of it. And it's, it's, it's a short video, it's about eight minutes, uh, and it's absolutely flabbergasting the kind of things that, that could be done without you even realizing and how they get to extract data um, in such, I, I, I hesitate between cunning and, cunning and, and funny, uh, definitely let's say concerning ways. So let's, let's do a small summary about what is it that we are discussing when it comes to, um, um, to rights. If you look at this particular slide, this, this slide is extremely summarized, so it, it's, it's an oversimplification of, of the whole thing. But for the purposes of this conversation, it's going to be more than enough. So when we, when we adopted, you know, when people decided, oh, there's, there's such a thing as human rights, let's work for it. And, you know, it didn't happen overnight as well. It took actually centuries from, from, um, from the very beginning all the way to the Universal Declaration of, of, uh, um, of Human Rights. There's been so many steps in, in between. And the good thing is that someone at some point decided that you know, the core element around um, human rights were 
Well, hello, humans, okay? It's in the name. And so what we analyzed here was that there's humans can be exposed to, to a number of harms across their life. Uh, and once you have that list of potential harms, what you can do is to build specific right definitions to try to proactively avoid those specific harms. But pay attention to that. You need to first list the harms. And that's what we've been discovering uh, uh, over, over, uh, over centuries. What are the specific harms that people can be exposed to? And those have been the ones, once we, when we, once we observed that they were relevant, then we started legislating to try to create proactive or, or attempts of proactive uh, uh, avoidance of those uh, specific personal harms. And those, those um, rights have been uh, put together into documents such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, sometimes they are in, uh, in constitutional law as well. Uh, you have in, in data protection laws uh, and so forth and so forth. And all of those are enacted and put together. And there is an element of duty of care specifically by um, governments and in occasions, supranational um, organizations depend on what's their um, uh, the legal the, the jurisdiction. Um, in order to implement and observe those rights. And let, let, let me reminded that those rights come attached with duties of care. And there's no obligation, specifically if, if, uh, if they are attached to the constitution for governments to, to comply with them and to, and to make the necessary for those to happen. Now, I would also point out that I'm, I'm not the kind of person who think that rights are just, you know, um, um, given for free. I think that there's a component of responsibility for everyone to make sure that those rights are also uh, being observed. Um, so if I want um, privacy to be something that is still valid, I need to make sure to defend other people's privacy too. If I want to have freedom of, of, uh, of expression, I also need to make sure that others can also uh, benefit of freedom of expression. You, you have to have a proactive attitude and mentality to make sure that all the rights that have taken so long to actually be obtained, they just don't jump through the, through the window just because there's been a mismanagement or people believe that they are not necessary anymore. Uh, I've, never, I've never heard about any right that we have that has gone mainstream that has ever expired in terms of necessity. Now, let's look for a moment when it comes to, um, to data. What happens there? Um, well, we're looking into um, digital harms. And so the question is, in the same way that we've been able to, to look into uh, personal harms um, uh, from a human perspective, well, we should look into digital harm from the technological perspective. And what really affects there is the data. It's not about people, it's about the data that represents people. And this is where the technical component comes in. This is when the programmers, the technologists have to come in because uh, human rights will be defended by, uh, uh, by civil society organizations and by other people who are involved into the movement. But when it comes to digital rights, it's gonna be technologists who are gonna be taking care of this. Only them have the knowledge, just as only a car engineer can actually design and build a car that is gonna be safe. You don't expect people to, um, um, to participate into that. At most, people will be requesting for the cars to be safe and then the government will take the steps. You see, you see how, how this plays out. So once you have a list of digital harms, and I can't get into too many details because we really don't have the time for this today. You basically obtain a, what's called a taxonomy that would allow you to also make your definition in return following the same example that we saw on, on human rights for those digital rights, which would be pieces of code that would attempt proactively to avoid a specific name and label and tag digital, digital harm. But those should be um, also collected into documents. In this case, for instance, with, uh, um, pretty much the same that I was mentioning before with this national constitution or in the attempt of the universal declaration of digital rights that the IO Foundation is trying to put forward. And with the same type of uh, duties of care and responsibilities. So um, this, maybe I shouldn't have changed, uh, have labeled this, um, um, this slide as how do we fix this? Because um, it's more about what we are looking into um, from the IO Foundation perspective. But definitely you should think that this also involves you. This is not going to be happening. This, none of this is going to be changed or, or, or improved unless people demand for that change. And unless we start um, training our engineers in a way that is going to be uh, much more easy for them to embrace their role as defenders. So one of the things that the IO Foundation does is that we try to push for what's called 
a universal declaration of digital rights, which again, I don't have that much time today to, to explain too much. Um, it suffice to say that it is essentially a document based on UDHR that will be pretty much technical in essence that will provide the guidance for technologies to know exactly how to implement software and how to incorporate a number of, uh, let's say, libraries of software that would provide the protection transparently by creating an abstraction layer on how to manage personal data so that they can concentrate on the business logic uh, um, of, of things and not having to, to, uh, to worry themselves in terms of compliance, in terms of whether they are uh, exposing um, um, people's data uh, at risk. And this, the citizen would also be much more reassured in terms of compliance because verification would be way more automated. We also run um, an initiative called uh, DECA, where we invite programmers to join us every single month. We run an event every month online uh, and we provide capacity building training and also pairing with um, um, open source projects. We also bring organizations that provide uh, pro bono services to um, all the community. And we also invite civil society organizations to join. So we are building an ecosystem in order to attempt this long-term vision of generating agents of change from programmers so that they come here, they get the information that they know, they get to learn not only um, um, hard skills or tech skills, but also soft skills. Because if you think about it, and if there's anyone here from computer science looking at this, at this talk, it will be interesting for you to consider. There isn't that many um, faculties that are providing things such as public speaking abilities. And if you want to have technologies who are gonna be you know, going out and trying to change things, they need to know how to communicate. That is not a typical um, skill that is provided in computer science. In some places in the world it is, but it, it really is a minority. And the third one is ecosystem mapping. Who is doing what and where? If I want to start changing something, where do I go? Um, we also run an uh, initiative on DHR in technology. So this is, uh, I was mentioning before, on the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights in Technology. And in particular, in Malaysia, we've been running a program for over two years, almost two years and a half, um, helping and participating on the drafting of the National Action Plan here in, in Malaysia for Business and Human Rights. Malaysia is a signatory of that, uh, uh, of that commitment. And we've been um, trying to, to convince the authorities to, to consider technology as a thematic area. Uh, and if not, at least to look into uh, making a, what's called a cross-cutting issue. Again, I cannot really, unfortunately, get into details. If anyone is interested, uh, by all means, just reach out to me and I can explain a bit more about how this works out. Now, I was mentioning about the element of um, um, programmers as the next generation of rice defenders. And in order to do that, you know, pretty words are pretty words and you need to start digging a little bit more into how you're gonna be doing that. And we decided to just provide a little bit of easy memo techniques for, uh, for programmers to keep in mind so that they, every time that they're coding, they will have a little bit of a new paradigm uh, shift in terms of uh, how to architect their applications. And so we, we came up with uh, what we call the DCDR principles, the data centric digital rights principles. And it's very, they are very concise. We, you know, everyone is, is generating principles all over the place. So uh, you don't want to be uh, piling up too much into it. So principle one is, we call it as I am my data. Uh, and it's very much the reflection, uh, if you will, we put it in this way, treat others' data the way you would like to be treated. And that changes already the, the, the way that you're observing at everybody's data and how you're uh, using it in your, um, uh, in your soft. The second one is end remedy. And this is a kind of a proactive mentality um, extracted from the pillar three from um, uh, business and human rights, which is access to remedy. Um, for um, anything that is not technology, you can always try to be proactive, but it's, it's, it's typically problematic. So in essence, law tends to be very reactive. A problem happens, and once we, we, def we define that as a problem, oh, so we need to regulate this to make sure that if it happens, we have uh, means for, for, for remedy. Uh, when it comes to, to, to programming, you actually can be very proactive. And you can have a mentality to, why do I want to have the ability to sue a company for selling my data if the technology can make sure by design that the data is not being sold? I'd rather code the first element so I don't need to go for remedy. And that creates more trust and more reliability into, into the software. And the third one is rights by design. So we, we feel that privacy by design is, is, is not enough anymore. 
because uh, privacy is just one element that you need to protect with software. And so when you're looking into um, all the regulations and all the rights that you have in a specific jurisdiction, the question is why as a user, I have to be the one concerned about uh, um, getting into, uh, into the application and the protection when technology should be doing it transparently. And so the idea of rights by design is every single regulation that protects you in your jurisdiction should be embedded in the technology by design. And therefore you shouldn't have to care so much. You, you won't be have, you know, airbags, um, seat belts, and whether you can drink or not water, all of those are implemented by design. You get the product, it's good for you. If anything goes wrong, you still have means for remedies. I mean, you can get poisoned because something happened in Shabbos. Yeah, I mean, accidents occur, but those are gonna be negligible uh, uh, compared to the many hours and many days and many years where the service has been ininterrupted and has been providing you a, a healthy service, okay? So we need to think about changing a little bit the paradigm on how we are designing the software. Now, how could this play out for you? Because you know, all of this might be something to abstract because it's basically trying to convince that there has to be a shift of, of responsibility from the end user to the actual uh, governments and uh, implementers, designers, architects of, uh, of software services and infrastructures. Now, how does that translate to you? Well, it would translate, let me put it this way. So you know that there is such a thing as third-party third sharing of data. So you, you, you may want to, uh, you know, you go to your, to your bank and they tell you uh, that there's a checkbox there that you authorize uh, the bank to share uh, the data with their um, 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 group members, but also with third-party um, companies. And maybe you say, no, I'm not okay with that. I'm all right with the, with the group. I'm all right with the, you know, whichever companies are, let's say CIMB, Maybank, whatever, uh, but I don't want them to be selling this to Nestle or to Pfizer or to, you know, which, whichever company you can, you can think of, I mean, it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. Because sometimes you wonder why, because I'm getting a banking service, why, why this company that has nothing to do with the banking service may want to have access to my data, what are they gonna be doing? With it? And so maybe your personal decision is, no, I don't wanna share that data. How many times you have gone to different websites asking you for consent or cookies? One after the other, one after the other, one after the other. Now you change your, your, uh, your, your mobile phone and you now again have to go through all the acceptance of all of those conditions. Wouldn't it be just more simple to actually have a general setting that says, I'm not interested on third party data sharing. And that would filter any company that is, that is providing you or even forcing you to have access to, 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 to abide by that regulation or by that option before they can give you the service. I mean, I would prefer to have that as a setting on, let's say my um, um, Google Play Store so that all the apps that are, that are uh, shown to me do not request specific uh, uh, access to, uh, to settings on my phone and do not ask me to share my data with third parties. It will be just an absolutely removal of, 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 uh, uh, of problematic on, on, on that. Why are we not doing that? That would be a very easy uh, system to implement compared to many other things. Uh, and, and it would pretty much simplify everybody's life. Now, one last thing that I want to look into, Personal assistance, this particularly creeps me out to, the, to a degree that I cannot express in words. We are inviting constantly the spokesperson of all of those private companies in our places. And please be reminded that when I know exactly how you behave and what you need, I know more information about your mind, therefore the black box of your head, and I know exactly the, the buttons that I have to press. If you think about the way information has been flowing from, uh, um, 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 from sources to us across history. I have a whole presentation on how this plays out. Um, when you interact, so when you go to a website and you look at, you know, florists, you go, you wanna buy florists and it gives you pages and pages and pages. You know right now, but if you're not in the first two pages, you don't exist. And everyone is competing to be in the first and the top five, all right? Now, if I ask, hey Siri, where can I buy uh, 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 flowers? And Siri's so gonna go, hold on, John, I got 25 pages with 50 hits each one of them. Let me read them to you one by one. No, that's not the kind of interaction that you want with voice. So what Siri's gonna do is gonna be pushing to you one or two option stops. But the question is, who are those options? How much they pay to be there? And are they really the best option for you? Because that categorization just disappears. 
they are not anymore finding you the best thing that you, that you require or that you will need, but the best thing that complies with their business model. And so I call this personal assistance, which are gonna be fundamental for us to, to move in the future. I mean, think about how many digital twins you're gonna to have to be managing. This is gonna be absolutely bananas and you're gonna need software to assist you with that. I call them personal fi emotional firewalls. We need to make sure that those things do not get in the way of your personal liberty, but also that you are at all even times being assisted by a piece of software that has your interests in mind and not specific corporation business model in, in mind. And you know, this is slowly happening. All right, so in summary, things that need to change. Do we need to change? So the quick answer is yes. How? We need to start shifting the balance from users into uh, the actual experts of the area. We need to start believing more in, the, in, in those experts and we need to give them the tools for them to be able to embrace that role. It's not gonna be easy, uh, but as anything, if you don't start making changes, too bad. Governments are gonna have uh, a lot to say, academia is gonna have a lot to say, and please as a citizen, demand that change. Look into what is it that you can do. Protect yourself as much as possible and request that people who know better can make have the tools in order to protect you. Those, those, that's gonna be the only way uh, moving forward. Now, I always like to part my, um, my talks with a couple of things. So the first one is, please consider that we are not the people anymore. We are the actual cyborgs. And if you think that this is an, an exaggeration, I invite you to send me by post larger your smartphones and I will have this conversation with you again in one with that. It is not because the smartphone is not injected in your body, but it hasn't become an essential part of you. The only difference is if it was connected to your body, the interface will be what changes. Right now you have an interface, which is your eyes and your, uh, and your fingers. That's the way you are interacting with this piece that is at the moment external. But you know, neural, uh, Elon Musk is working on, on a company called Neuralink, where basically they can actually implant a chip nowadays and you can do stuff with it. So uh, we are not so far from it and we are already actively cyborgs. And finally, this is possibly the nerdiest joke I've ever heard in my life and I really love it. Is I would like to change the world, but they don't give me the source code. Now, if you think about how much this applies to new technologies, you can realize how much we can actually change technology so that it actually implements our rights by design. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, John. Thank you so much for giving us the insights about the data and my, my data and I and how what needs to be changed. So now let's move on after the talk. Maybe some of you may have questions for John to answer about the talk. All right, do you have any questions? Please raise your hand. But I see there is, um, I think one question posted by Prof Bradley. I will just read it out. John, maybe you can see how you were able to help him to answer these questions. Most people yeah. I know don't read the terms of service. To a large extent, we agree because we just want to use the app or website. Is it realistic to expect individuals to read the terms and demand a fairer system? Or should this be a discussion between governments and tech firms and perhaps independent associations? What organization are fighting for our digital rights then? Okay, so when it comes to the demand, the demand has to come from the people. If there's no demand from the people, no one's gonna to want to do anything. That's, that's, that's quite, uh, you know, you, it, it, because cars were killing people and people started being outraged about it and also possibly governments were not really concerned, then regulations came in in order to force to have seat belts, but also to have um, airbags, et cetera, et cetera. So the demand has always have to come from the citizenry itself. Now, when it comes to, to how to implement that, well, there's a number of things here that are very interesting when it comes to the terms and conditions. It's very interesting that it's just a piece of paper or a piece of text, but it isn't something that is machine readable. So you can interpret it with, 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 with software but it's not defined in a way that you could apply settings on it, as I was mentioning in my, in my previous example. And so things that could be done, for instance, is that there's been some, um, some projects that have been worked on, on this. So there's, for instance, this one in Spain called Consent Commons, where what they did was to, to try to analyze different chunks of uh, data protection laws all over the world and, and try to create icons. Out of it. 
so that you could basically try to, instead of read 25 pages or 30 pages of a, a, of a, a never ending um, legal jargon that most of the time we don't understand what it is because you don't have the training, is by the way, one of the things that they're counting on, you could represent that information in, a, uh, um, um, in small, um, easy to, to digest uh, iconography. Very similar to what you have right now in terms of the warnings when you watch a TV series, you know, when they tell you, you know, where there's gonna be violence and, and so forth. And so you, you, can, you can inform yourself with just quick look, da, 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 da. okay, yes, no. So that would be a way to allow users to understand better those terms and conditions. The, the step further is make that decision um, uh, resilient and, and, and permanent so that now I have selected what is it that I don't want moving forward. So I don't want any piece of software that is doing this particular type of request, sharing with third parties. I'm gonna use the same example. And that should be in a, um, um, uh, in a setting on your device, specifically should be in a setting on the personal assistant and the personal assistant should be coming with you no matter where you go. It's kind of, you know, the, the possibility of, of, of changing devices. Um, now, organizations that are working on, on this, you have, from civil society, there aren't that, there aren't that many. Um, and, and it's not that there isn't, so let me nuance a little bit that. There's quite an amount of organizations in the society that work on this from the policy perspective. From those, several of them, I mean, there's plenty all over the world. Um, when it comes from a technical perspective, I only know two of them, and one of them is the AIO Commission. But from a technical aspect, it, there are, this is not to say that there aren't um, um, working groups that are not necessarily um, having a legal, um, a legal entity, okay? Um, and there's also um, some private sector that seems to have understood the importance of it, and they seem to also be pushing for this. Now, I also want to caution about, um, when we talk about um, um, data management and so forth, when it comes to things such as data portability, that's another fallacy that I didn't have time today to, uh, I had to trim the presentation. Careful with data portability, because it's, it's not clear what is behind that in terms of intention. So when you hear companies that put into the Facebook, Twitter, and so forth, getting together to try to maximize data portability between platforms, you have to think that what is, why would they be interested in releasing the data? And the reason is, is quite simple. It's because the data somehow is not the actual end goal anymore. Data is a fuel that allows for AI systems to be perfected. So what, what's important with the competition is now about how better my AI system is. And in order to do that, what I need to do is, is make it simple for people to move from one point to another. And, and I hate falling into this conspiracy theory thinking. It's just the, the industry, and I'm talking about the general industry at, at, at large, has a lot of examples of connivance between companies. So, you know, milk has, has uh, in, in, I can't remember, in Spain, for instance, there was uh, a scandal about um, um, milk companies basically uh, setting the price in the market just to make sure there was no competition because it was benefiting them to say, you know, this, this amount of euros per liter and we're gonna be margins, you know, five, 10 cents up and down. So that's gonna be giving the, 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 the resemblance of competition, but in the end, we're basically rigging the game. And in here, it's not gonna to be too difficult to basically rig the game, to basically piece off 5% 5, 5 of, the, of the users from Twitter, piece off 5% of the users of, of Facebook and do the swap. And that can totally be arranged between Twitter and, and, and Facebook. This is not going to be a problem because they're basically interested in that exchange. So what's going to be stopping that from happening? Do I want, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that's going to be a, a very good uh, direction for, for us to take. So making sure about how data protection laws are designed and specifically um, um, how that information, again, I keep thinking that there's a lot to be learned from systems that we had already in place before, anything that has to do with uh, um, 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 international diplomacy, international relations between, uh, between different jurisdictions should also be applied when it comes to, to data at the same level that, that, that it is applied for the physical uh, beings of, um, of us. And so if I am kidnapped in Colombia and the French government happens to be French, if, if the French government doesn't do anything, that actually can escalate into an uh, international um, incident. So the reason, so the question is, if, if some of my data ends up being in Colombia without my consent, why is not the French government actually uh, going, going against them, like actively? Because it's basically a representation of their own citizen. And until we make that leap, 
going to be very, very difficult to understand how, how dangerous it is for us to have our, our, our I hope that answers the question. Yes. Uh, Prof Bradley, do you want to add on anything from your question? No, that was a, that answered it. Thanks. All right. Yeah, we have another question from Wesley. Yes, Wesley, you can unmute. Good, good afternoon, Dr. Ketchin. Good afternoon, sir. Based on what I've heard from, from this talk, uh, basically, I, what I see that the terms and conditions is essentially a contract between the between the user and whatever social media company. But from but the way I'm interpreting it is that you're suggesting that that the government dictate those terms and conditions. It's essentially dictating the contract. Now, if I were doing business with you, sir, I the the terms should be dictated by both of us. The government should not be dictating be dictating what the terms okay, of the okay. contracts so, are. So, so and, and yeah. as the saying goes, if men were angels, then no government would be necessary and government is staffed by men. So, and wouldn't this, wouldn't be what you're saying, increase the control of the government over its people? Okay, so basically you're proposing that you and I can get into an agreement of slavery. Uh -oh. If the terms and conditions are, all, are only to be discussed between you and me, then you can propose me to be to be your slave in exchange of a you know modicum um, um, salary and maybe give some benefits to the rest of my family. I'm just going to sacrifice myself for my for my family and just become uh, uh, get, get into uh, enslaved. Uh, in, uh, how was was uh, um, there was a term for that? But yeah, let's, let's just summarize that as slavery. It is not possible, and you can imagine why. So governments are there basically to to try to protect things that as an individual are competent. As an individual, I cannot build a road. And as an individual, I cannot build a, a school or a hospital. You pull together resources, and I'm not saying the governments are perfect by any stretch of the imagination, not a single one in the world that I'm aware of, okay? It's still the best system that you have in order to make sure that things that you cannot do on your own are outsourced. And as part of your responsibility as a citizen, every four years, you get to vote to try to redirect a little bit the ship in case it has, it has lost, uh, lost course. That's the responsibility of, uh, uh, as a citizen. So when I hear people, I don't want to go and vote. I don't, I don't believe that changes anything. Well, definitely not going to vote does change something. That's definitely a yes. And so what I'm, what I'm proposing here is that the government is establishing a number of regulations, okay? Those regulations I have to abide uh, by. And you as a, as, a, as a business, if you want to make business in this jurisdiction, you also have to abide by. Think, think, think about having ethical systems that disappear just because you cannot enforce them through, through law. The, one of the things that the government does is to make, make sure that your inability to defend yourself against a, a big corporation is, is, is lessening. That you have the possibility to have mechanisms that are gonna be behind you in case of abuse. And so when it comes to the terms of, uh, uh, and conditions, sure, you can establish a number of, uh, of things, but it also boils down to how much of a, how much of a Damocles sword you're, you're having in, uh, on, on, on top of my head. So for instance, let me say that in order to pay bills, I can only pay now by bank. There's no way to go anywhere and pay cash. DNB doesn't accept any more cash, nothing. It has to be through bank. So now I have a, a, a captive market where everyone has to go through a banking entity in order to do that. And the bank will tell, oh, now we are in a position of, uh, of benefit, basically a position of power. Now I can force you to do whatever the hell I want because you will have no other option than to go through one of us, the 25, I mean, there are not that many banks, okay? They all free to have a meeting in a big meeting room. And they all can get together, you know what? We're going to force all of our clients to go on third-party sharing. Otherwise, they cannot open a bank account or they cannot do transfers to John Pay. And now what? You're going to tell me you're going to not want electricity anymore in your, in, in your life just because of that? That's the kind of abuse that you need to try to avoid. So not all clauses, and I'm pretty sure some lawyer here can make a, a proper case about it. Um, not all clauses are okay. And that's the reason why you have this kind of protection. Right, thank you for responding. 
Can we have one more last question from the floor? Looking at the time that we have, do you have any more questions from the floor students or lecturers for John for today's topic? Okay. If you have not have any at the moment, if you have think about it and later on have any questions, please feel free to contact the organizing team. Let me show you uh, who we have at this uh, organizing team. Can we have the slide next? Okay, uh, I would like to acknowledge the organizing team for this uh, organizing this talk, uh, Next Gen PR comprises of four communication students or year two students. They are Isabel, Natasha, Kiru, and Jyoti. So four of them actually helped me in organizing this talk. And I hope that we have provided you uh, sufficient information to digest. I think this is a very huge and abstract topic that you cannot just get it once and then you remember what is going on. But you know that we contribute to the data the data represent us, as John has mentioned, we have to make some change in ourselves to ensure that we are not able to uh, disclose everything. If we don't like everyone else to know about our data, our, ourselves personally, then we do, should also be careful of what the things that you post on a di digital world. Okay, uh, before we end today's session, I would like to pass this back to the MC and let it do the closing. Jyoti, back to you. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Jean. On behalf of everyone here today, thank you for taking the time to speak to us on the very important topic of digital rights. I'm sure that your inspiring speech and deep insight into the various aspects of our digital footprint, as well as how our information is being used online, has given us a better insight on how to be more conscious of the information that we allow the public to have access to. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, that wraps up our afternoon. Before we conclude, let us all turn on our cameras and have a photo taking session to commemorate today's rewarding webinar. Okay, give me one second. Yeah, can we have those who are here today, please on your video. And um, I believe John has put in his contact in the chat box. Anyone who's interested to find out more about this topic, please feel free to send the email and the email is stated over here. Natasha is ready, you just have to count down, then we will have the photo picture, the photo that we have here. And I'm sure I'm not going to post it out later on, it will be just given as a, a, a token of appreciation we'll send to John, but those who request for it, uh, we can consider giving it to you. Okay, first, yeah, uh, first page, three, two, one. Okay. Second page, three, two, one. Third page, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. And the last page, three, two, one. Okay, thank you. I'm done. All right, thank you very much. And hope you have a nice day. All right, thank you everyone for turning on your cameras. On behalf of the organizing committee Next Gen PR, we have Miss Isabel Santo Domingo from Logistics and Miss Natasha Hagen heading our publicity and design. Ms. Q from Event Management, as well as myself, and of course, the ever so supportive Dr. Catherine. We would like to thank you all for making time in your busy schedule to join us here this afternoon. We wish you all a very pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.